La verdad nos hace libres. Hace libres. Volunteers in Medicine es una organización sin fines de lucro que busca proporcionar atención médica a personas no aseguradas. La organización ayuda con el desarrollo y el lanzamiento de nuevas clínicas de atención de salud. Las clínicas se han establecido en 29 estados de Estados Unidos. La misión declarada de la organización es promover y guiar el desarrollo de una red nacional de clínicas gratuitas, enfatizando el uso de voluntarios médicos y comunitarios jubilados dentro de una cultura de cuidado para mejorar el acceso a la atención médica para los desatendidos de Estados Unidos, especialmente los no asegurados. Volunteers otorga atención primaria a adultos de bajos ingresos y subatendidos. Incluso con la ley del cuidado de salud a bajo precio, muchas personas carecen de los medios financieros para pagar altos deducibles, copagos y otros gastos de bolsillo. Los servicios incluyen atención primaria de la salud, atención de la salud conductual, gestión de la diabetes, farmacia en el lugar y terapia física. Volunteers in Medicine se basa en el esfuerzo colectivo de apoyo voluntario en una gama de áreas médicas y administrativas para mantener la clínica funcionando. Más de 500 voluntarios contribuyen a las operaciones diarias y la misión a largo plazo es asegurar que los residentes de bajos ingresos y marginados tengan acceso a atención médica de calidad. Desde Nueva York estamos con Juan Carlos Salcedo y a través de él vamos a dar la bienvenida a nuestras dos invitadas. Juan Carlos, un gusto tenerte aquí en La Verdad Nos Hace Libres. Un abrazo. Bueno, muchas gracias Roberto. Muy buenas noches a la audiencia de La Verdad Nos Hace Libres. Nuevamente desde el Estudio 3 en Nueva York, un saludo muy cordial a ustedes y al equipo que hace posible este programa. Como ya es habitual, cada semana ponemos a consideración de nuestra audiencia un tema de interés mundial y regional. Una de las características más enraizadas en los Estados Unidos es el voluntariado. La mayor parte de la población está envuelta desde temprana edad en alguna forma de acción voluntaria. Importantes servicios vitales a las comunidades, como el servicio de bomberos y de emergencia, operan a base de voluntarios altamente entrenados y motivados. El famoso político y científico francés Alex de Tocqueville, en su libro publicado en 1835 llamado Democracia en América, al referirse a este país dijo que esta es una de las naciones de voluntarios que trabajan juntos para alcanzar objetivos comunes para el bien de la sociedad. Hoy tenemos el privilegio de conversar con uno de esos grupos de voluntarios quienes sin esperar que el gobierno o el Congreso de este país solucione el inmenso y complejo problema del acceso a los servicios de salud, y ya desde los principios de los noventas, en esa tradición de voluntaria voluntariado, creó una organización de clínicas esparcidas por todo el país, esencialmente empoderando a doctores y enfermeras jubiladas y a otros expertos en salud a trabajar hasta ahora sirven aproximadamente 95 mil pacientes anuales y todo ello de manera gratuita. El día de hoy con nosotros tenemos a Sas Xavianchi desde Burlington, Vermont, directora ejecutiva nacional del programa y en el otro extremo del país a 4.731 kilómetros de distancia a Maureen Harton, ejecutiva principal de una de las clínicas en Cajón, en, el, en San Diego, California. Les damos la bienvenida. Welcome to the program and um, thank you very much. And uh, we will go right at it. And my first question is for uh, Sasha. And uh, we would like to 
please to, for you to tell us who are the volunteers in medicine and uh, what do you do? Hola, gracias por invitarme. Um, so Volunteers in Medicine is a national organization. We help uh, communities set up free healthcare clinics around the country. Uh, we currently, uh, we've set up around 110 clinics uh, since 1993, um, and we are in 28 different states in the country. So we, um, we work with the communities to get these clinics set up, um, and then once they get set up, they become their own nonprofit, but we keep them as part of our family, um, continuing to provide opportunities for the clinics to share best practices with one another. Tenemos dos invitadas el día de hoy. Estamos con también Maureen Harting, ejecutiva principal de voluntariado en medicina desde San Diego, California. Y vamos a preguntarles a ambas qué criterio deben tener eh, las organizaciones locales para ser parte de voluntarios de medicina y de cuántos voluntarios y clínicas estamos hablando. Well, we have a question for both of you. And what is the criteria to be a clinic? and uh, how many clinics there are. I think you mentioned 110, and um, how many volunteers uh, work on those 110 uh, uh, clinics. Uh, first, uh, please, Maureen. Well, I can only speak for our clinic in San Diego, okay. and we have uh, 12 medical providers, so uh, about 12 nurses, uh, totally over a little over 100 volunteers. Uh, we're open six days a week, and we see patients who do not have health care insurance. Uh, Sasha, t tell us the national vision, please. Sure. So, um, in the cl we started 110 clinics. We have 88 clinics that are still part of our network. Um, some of our clinics have changed form, so they may, may start using in, um, accepting insurance. Um, and then they, don't, they are no longer part of our network. But we have 88 clinics. Um, and those um, clinics had a total of about 10,500 volunteers that they uh, used to provide their services. Um, and the clinics each set their own eligibility cr criteria. All of them are serving the uninsured. Some have also started to serve the underinsured, people who have insurance, but for whatever reason, they're not able to use that insurance. It might be that their deductibles are too high or they don't have insurance for the specific service that they need. Well, thank you. And I have a question for uh, Maureen. Uh, your clinic and all the clinics in this network not only heal people with, for uh, of physical ailments, but also you heal uh, spiritually. Uh, to people who are uh, hurt because uh, prejudice uh, or because they were invisible or people were indifferent towards them. So, uh, I mean, when you, they come to your clinic, they um, get a whole um, uh, perspective of what is to be part of a regular healthcare from the physical to the uh, psychological, I, I assume. Yes, they do. We offer actually comprehensive medical care. So we, in where we're situated in San Diego County, we have a fair number of an immigrant population, a lot from the Middle East, some from Latin America, from Mexico, um, and they're considered undocumented. So they don't have access to federal status or state status for healthcare. So we see a fair number of those patients. Um, we operate with the VIM philosophy that we treat all of our patients with dignity and respect. We don't ask them if they have citizenship, we just take care of them. Queremos recordarles a nuestros oyentes y televidentes que estamos hablando acerca de la atención voluntaria en medicina, principalmente en los Estados Unidos, teniendo en cuenta estos temas importantes relacionados con la salud, identificados con una línea muy particular, principalmente para aquellos que no tienen acceso así directo para esta atención. La pregunta va para Sasha y también para Maureen. ¿Son las clínicas de voluntarios en medicina para personas con pocos recursos la alternativa a las visitas en salas de emergencia o es más bien un proyecto de cuidado de salud preventiva y de cura? ¿Qué dicen ustedes? 
Well, the question is for both, and uh, we will ask uh, first uh, Sasha to comment on this. Uh, volunteers in medicine have a system uh, that is, uh, in many ways, an alternative to uh, healthcare on emergency rooms, but um, uh, we assume it is much more than that. It is preventive medicine. It is the whole package. So if you could tell us first, and then Maureen, if you have probably additional comments. So one of the core pro parts of our model is that the clinics will be providing primary care. So really a strong focus on prevention, a strong focus on comprehensive health care, um, and really integrating all the different parts of healthcare, which is a challenge in the traditional uh, medical system. Uh, the benefit of the clinics, many of our clinics, is that they're they're all under one roof. So all the services are under one roof. The specialists, the doc, the uh, primary care doctors. Sometimes they have a pharmacy on site, um, and so be because of that, and and also because um, there's no need to worry about billing insurance. Um, and how much time each doctor can spend with the patient. There's a lot of communication that can happen, which really helps to treat the whole patient. Uh, Maureen, um, you were even talking about, uh, when we were off camera, about you even have a community garden. I mean, you. just you, you went all that all the way from even before they step into the into the clinic. Please tell us about it. We were fortunate several years back, the American Medical Association gave us a grant to establish a patient community garden. So the patients can receive a garden plot for free. We're also very fortunate in California, you can grow food all year long. So we have a number of gardeners. Uh, we offer it to the community at a nominal fee for the water. And part of the model is keeping people well. So we teach people how to garden. We have a dietitian on staff who does nutrition counseling. We actually have had cooking classes. We've had grocery store shopping tours with our dietitian to tell people, instruct people how to read labels. So it's a model. We also partner with the YMCA here and they give our patients who couldn't afford to go to the Y a free membership. And they're, they're able to take all of the classes, the exercise classes, the weight room. So it's a comprehensive, we try to keep our patients well out of the emergency room, out of the hospital and healthy. Uh, I have a question for uh, Sasha. Uh, when we talk about health in the United States, uh, we look at the statistics and the United States is divided by geography, some places with great access to health, some places not so uh, much, and also by income. So how does your strategy uh, for uh, uh, your organization address this uh, phenomenon? So because, of, because our clinics are all um, in the community, they're really rooted in the community, um, we, the, the community leaders come to us and say that they have an interest in starting these clinics. Um, and we work with them when they come to us. And that's a really important part of the model because we don't go into the communities and say, you need a clinic here. Um, when the people come to us, they are leaders, they are already invested in making this change in their community. Um, we work with them to make sure that they're connected um, with the different parts of the community, so the medical providers, but also faith community, um, the business leaders, any potential donors, um, so that from the very beginning, this is a community-owned clinic, and that helps to sustain the clinic over time. Um, we definitely want to increase our visibility so that more of these community leaders in these places where clinics are needed will know about us. Um, and this is part of that, um, doing sort of media, more media stuff. But, um, you know, if they can find us, then that, once they come to us, then we work with them how to get it into their community. Queremos recordarles que esta entrevista, como las otras que hemos realizado aquí en La Verdad Nos Hace Libres, también se difunden en los Estados Unidos a través de Optimum, este servicio de cable en el país del norte. Continuamos hablando acerca de este tema de la salud en Estados Unidos. ¿Es o fue bueno el Obamacare para los norteamericanos? ¿Qué dicen ustedes, Maureen y Sasha? What are your thoughts? Was Obamacare uh, 
good for the United States or it wasn't? Uh, Sasha, please. I would say there's no question that Obamacare increased the amount of people who have insurance. There's lots of data to show that. Um, I think that, you know, the challenge with Obamacare is that people had a perception that it was universal health care, universal health insurance, and it wasn't, and it wasn't really designed to be that. So the need continued for the people who either didn't qualify for that insurance, um, the undocumented people are a great example, but there were others who, um, if they were in a state where they didn't expand Medicaid, which is a public insurance uh, program, that um, some states made the requirements for that in terms of income broader. So more people qualified for the, the subsidies to help them pay for it. And the states that did not do that, um, the people could not afford the insurance because they didn't get that extra help that they needed. And so for those people, um, Obamacare really didn't help them all that much. Um, the other thing is that health insurance is not the same thing as access, as you've mentioned to me is, you know, so that just to have health insurance doesn't mean that you can find a doctor that takes your health insurance or you can get to the doctor to, to have that insurance be used. So that is another issue um, and another reason why our clinics are still really, really needed. You're uh, very quickly, Maureen, what are your views about Obamacare? Help didn't help. What are your thoughts? I agree with Sasha. It certainly has changed a lot of people's lives. Unfortunately, a lot of our patients still can't afford it. And I'd just like to share a story with you. I interviewed a patient a few weeks ago who's 62 years old. He spent 40 years working at the same restaurant. He paid taxes. He's here legally. He's 62 years old. He has no health care insurance. The restaurant closed. He has no access to health care insurance, and he can't afford the Affordable Care Act. So he becomes our patient. In three years, he'll have Medicare eligibility, but right now he has health issues and he needs care. Um, so I think people like that, he's, he's existing on Social Security. $1,600 a month is not a lot of money to live in San Diego when you have to buy food and take care of you know, all kinds of needs. So that is an illustration, just a, a small synopsis of some of the patients that we deal with. They fall through the cracks and they can't afford the Affordable Care Act. United States uh, being a country, uh, uh, one of the most powerful countries in the world, uh, do you think that um, uh, being health so essential to the well-being of the population do you consider access to health a human right? What do you think, Sasha? Absolutely. I do. You know, I mean, I don't think that I would be doing this work if I didn't think that. Uh, and I just think uh, health is an investment in the community and in the people. So if, if people aren't healthy, then they really can't do much else. They can't work. They can't contribute to their community. They can't raise their children. Um, so if we can invest in, in people's health, then the benefits will, will pay for themselves. I agree. I, it's, it's Health is, is uh, as important as education. We have an, an educated population. We invest a lot of money in um, our educational system. We need to do the same with our health care system. It's a right, not a privilege. Bueno, tenemos algunos minutos más para esta entrevista. Estamos conociendo algunos tópicos importantes en relación al trabajo que llevan adelante Sasha Bianchi y Maureen Harting allá en el voluntariado en medicina en los Estados Unidos. Y la pregunta obviamente es para ambas. ¿Cómo las comunidades interactúan con las clínicas de voluntarios en medicina en distintas comunidades en aquella región? Question is for both, and uh, we will start with uh, Maureen. How do communities interact with the clinic, and uh, how, how is that process? We have a very supportive community where we're located. We're in a very low-income area of San Diego, so we do have a lot of support. We certainly have, uh, we sit on a, a piece of property that's owned by the United Methodist Church. They're our landlord for a dollar a year, so we always pay our rent on time. Um, so I think we would not be able to do what we, did, what we do without the volunteer commitment and the support of the community. Uh, Sasha? 
Um, I think that the, the, the process that I described to you before about from the beginning kind of getting the community involved in the effort uh, to start a clinic is a really important thing that happens. Um, and I think that because of that, the community from the beginning sees that this is, this is something that's going to benefit the people and they're much more on board to continue supporting the clinic, whether that be through volunteering, through donating money, through donating time or other resources. Um, and I think in, in particular, um, it's a very important relationship between the clinic and the hospital. A lot of the hospitals um, realize the benefit of having a free clinic to reduce the number of people that show up in the ER and, and don't have a, any care. What do you think uh, really motivates your volunteers? Is it um, that they want to give back to the community? They would like to gain some experience to move on into other uh, health uh, uh, facilities? Uh, what does it uh, motivate people to substantially impact the life, uh, the lives of uh, people they don't know and they just meet in clinics like this, Maureen? I think um, about half of our volunteers, our medical providers, currently are in medical practice. The other half are retired. And I think retired people benefited from their occupation. They want to give back. The people, the providers who um, have a practice now are, are just, they're involved in the healthcare community and they want to give back. I think we're a great training ground for people who aspire to be in a medical profession. This past year, we had three of our volunteers get into medical school, one into pharmacy school, and one into PA school. Um, that's a great opportunity to have young people have their first experience volunteering in the medical field. And we hope, I tell each and every one of them, when, you're, when you graduate and you're a doctor or you're a nurse or a pharmacist, give back to the community you're in or come back and volunteer at our clinic. I would echo most of what, um, all of what Maureen said. Um, I think the, the model is that by volunteering, the volunteers get as much out of it as the, the, the people who are receiving the care do. And, and that's definitely something that I've heard from all of the, the clinics. Some of them say even when the doctors have um, gotten too old to provide medical care, they'll still come to the clinic. They'll still hang out at the clinic. They want to be there. They want to be a part of it because it's really fulfilling for them and it's a community. Y una pregunta que no podía faltar en esta entrevista, hablando de la medicina, hablando de la salud, de este cuidado que es importante. ¿Hay alguna barrera con el trato médico a indocumentados, alguna política general que norme a estas clínicas? ¿Qué lectura tienen ustedes en relación a este punto? Well, there is uh, this issue that we have uh, looked at this and discussed uh, to a certain degree. Uh, there are many undocumented and I understand there's no policy in your clinics in one way or another. It's just... Uh, 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 open to anyone who is in need. But if you like to elaborate, uh, what kind of people come to the clinic? And I'm sure you see from all walks of life. Uh, the, ma the majority of our patients actually work every day. 78% of the patients that we see are employed. They just can't ha ha afford health care insurance. Where we're located, there is a large um, immigrant population, both from Iraq and several other Middle Eastern countries. We have quite a few patients from Guatemala, from Mexico, from some Latin American countries. A lot of them are not documented. Um, it makes it difficult sometimes to get them specialty care or to get them care beyond what we can provide because again, they don't have, under state and federal regulations, they don't have access to um, the Affordable Care Act or to Medicare. Yes, I think that's right on. Um, I think mo some of our clinics also provide care to children, not all of them. Um, most of them don't have to provide care to people over the age of 65 because Medicaid, Medicare is covering all that population. Um, that is our one government program for that's universal. <laughs> well, thank you very much both. And I am uh, so proud to uh, be able to speak to you. Uh, you represent the essence of what this country is all about, uh, volunteer work and making a difference. 
not waiting for the government, not waiting for programs, not waiting for anything, taking a, a, a challenge and doing it yourselves. And you have done an extraordinary job. I understand that over 420,000 people uh, visits uh, were uh, took place last year. That's uh, amazingly impressive, and we thank you for that. Roberto. Bueno, sí, eh, tus palabras son acertadas en este cierre de la entrevista y les agradecemos por estar aquí en La Verdad Nos Hace Libres a Sasha Bianchi, directora ejecutiva desde Burlington, estado de Vermont, y a Maureen Hartin, ejecutiva principal del voluntariado en medicina desde San Diego, en California, ambas en los Estados Unidos, hablando de esta atención voluntaria en medicina en aquel país. Queremos recordarles a todos ustedes que este programa se emite a través del cable en Optimum, este servicio de cable en los Estados Unidos, a quienes también les enviamos un saludo muy especial. Desde el corazón de Sudamérica, este ha sido nuestro contacto desde nuestro estudio 3 en Cold Spring, área metropolitana de Nueva York, junto a Juan Carlos Salcedo. Gracias, Sasha. Gracias, Maureen, por estar aquí. Thank you, thank you. Fue un placer. Ok, nosotros hacemos un paréntesis con la verdad. Que Dios los bendiga. Será hasta la próxima.